Okay, so we'll get started. Uh, it really is. It really is. It's a long name. Uh, I'd like to get started with a little anecdote uh, uh, first. On every sermon, I'll give you uh, maybe a little humorous uh, short phrase or, or uh, just a, a word, you know. But uh, t so, forget each kindness as soon as you've heard, as soon as you've done it. Here, let me put my head. <laughs> oh yeah, there we go. Uh, forget the praise that falls to you the moment you've won it. Uh, forget the slander that you hear before you can repeat it. Forget each slight, each spite, each sneer, whenever you may meet it. Remember every promise made and keep it to the letter. Remember those who lend you aid and be a grateful debtor. Remember all the happiness that comes your way in living. Forget each worry and distress. Be hopeful and forgiving. Remember good. Remember truth. Remember heaven is above you. And you will find through age and youth that many will love you. Now, let me, let me uh, pray here. Father, meet with us in your word. Read us your book and make the pages come alive. Teach us from it. We choose to listen carefully to your voice so that we can submit to it. Show us the intended meaning of the word that we may both live it out and encourage our brethren through it. Help us, Lord also to have a more thankful heart for all you do. Now, the, what I'm calling this message tonight is Never Forget, uh, and, and you'll find out why I, I use that. Uh, but we have certain days and events or maybe things that we should never forget. Uh, there's things that stand out in our minds, uh, like Pearl Harbor, uh, yeah, we know the exact time of that, 7.48 a.m., Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941. Uh, you know, there were two, almost 2,500 people were killed that morning. Uh, and, and more than that were wounded. And this was what, this is the event that led America into World War II. The, the battle cry of, of the United States all during World War II was remember Pearl Harbor. Or the assassination of John F. Kennedy. I don't know if you're old enough to remember that or not. Uh, but if, if you were alive then, it does stand out in your memory. Uh, or the uh, September 11th, 2001. Uh, uh, well, yeah, that was, uh, I was, I think I was, uh, wow, it was in 63, so I was three years old then, yeah. Uh, but I can remember it. I can remember everybody gathered around the, uh, yeah, around the TV, and everybody was kind of in shock, you know, because we didn't live that far from where he was shot. Uh, but September 11th, uh, everybody remembers that. I'm pretty sure uh, where the Al Qaeda terrorists hijacked four passenger jets and and then used them as weapons. Uh, two planes were crashed into the World Trade Center that made it collapse. 3,500 people died that day. And one of, one of the main things about September 11th is never forget. Um, so, they, why are these days and events important to us? Because what real people were lost in those. Fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, grand grandfathers, grandmothers, aunts, uncles, cousins, and kids. These were real people that had lives full of hope and joy and fear and pain and, and worries and cares and concerns. They were real people. So, also, we remember those because crimes were committed. Now, these were real hate crimes here. Crimes that only originate in hearts as black as sin and minds as corrupt as Satan himself. Crimes that ended the lives of, of 3,500 people. Crimes that changed the lives of millions because those people were no longer here to influence the lives of family and friends. These were real hate crimes. And third, because our peace and our security was lost. For the first time since Pearl Harbor, peace and security on our own soil was compromised. 
and, and a lot of people are still real insecure about that. For believers, there's, there's even more important days and events and things that we should never forget. Now, don't understand me. I'm not using... I'm I'm not downplaying any of these events that I used as an instruction as an as an as a introduction here. Uh, my deepest prayers are offered on the part of those families and individuals who suffered loss because of those events that I, I mentioned. But with that being said, there's a greater day than those days, a greater event than those events, or greater things than those things. There's certain days and events and things as Christians we should and must never forget. Uh, so let's let's consider the first thing we should never forget. We should never forget our sin. Our sin, it, it, sin is what brought about about pain and suffering into the world. Now, 9/11, that was a result of sin. The assassination of JFK was a result of sin. Uh, Pearl Harbor was a result of sin. All pain and heartbreak and, break and sorrow in this world from beginning to end are a direct result of sin. Now sin, from God's point of view, sin is universal. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Or, uh, John, 1 John uh, one eight. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Just one sin contaminates man. James two ten tells us, "For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all." Now this this passage it kind of it kind of puts the spotlight on the holiness of God, doesn't it? One sin is enough to stain us so much that a holy, sinless, righteous God can't bear or tolerate the presence of such such a person. Sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear so heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have, have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. So sin... It, it ultimately it condemns. Romans six twenty three tells us that the wages of sin is death. Or James one thirteen through fifteen, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has, hath conceived it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it's finished bringeth forth death. Sin is powerful. John eight thirty one and 34. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him and said, We be Abraham's seed, and we're in, no, it, we're, we were never in bondage to any man. How saith thou, ye shall be, be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now, I don't know if anybody told you this morning, but you can get uh, the, the notes from the sermon on this reference box to my right and kind of behind me. All you have to do is click it and it'll give you a folder. So, it was and it is our sin that will and can bring about pain and suffering. The definition of a fool is somebody that does the same thing over and over again and expects a, each time that the outcome is going to be different. And and I don't know about you, but I hit that trap every time. <laughs> we let it slip into our lives so warm and cozy, and then it turns into that demon. It is, and it tears our life apart. Uh, David and Bathsheba. David is an excellent example of how sin can creep into your life and just turn into a monster. Uh, remember Second Samuel 11 and 12 everybody knows this story David took Bathsheba who was Uriah's wife and David had Uriah killed the consequences of David's sin was staggering the child con conceived in adultery it died uh, his own children would kill and rape 
the sword never never stopped it was never abated in his house his own son would take his wives his own son rebelled against him and his own son died as a result of rebellion or david remember when david took a census he numbered israel uh second samuel 24 david took a census well why is that wrong everybody takes a census right but he forgets Gideon and that, that trust. So God gives him three choices of punishment. Seven years of famine, three months of fleeing, three days of pestilence, which would be his choice. In the end, 70,000 men, 70, men died. See, sin brings pain and suffering to, to, to everybody, to us and to others. Never forget the seriousness of sin. If we do, it, it may cost more than we're willing to pay. You know, in our society, we're tempted to make light of it. And if we don't watch ourselves, we will be making, making light of sin. But we have to remember the seriousness of sin as far as God is concerned. If, if, we've never, if we never forget our sin, we must never forget our sentence. Now, that helps us remember our sin, doesn't it? Hundreds of Nazi war criminals were sentenced at the end of World War II. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald survived it. If he had, had survived that attack on him by Jack Ruby, he, he would have probably been tried, convicted, and ex executed for the assassination of JFK. Those 19 terrorists that were responsible for the attacks of 9-11, if they'd survived, they would have been tried and convicted and executed because of the crimes they committed. Those who commit heinous crimes are sentenced, if caught and convicted, and, and oftentimes the sentence is death. All crime, uh, and in our case we're talking about sin, and it demands satisfaction. Uh, true justice demands satisfaction, it, it, but it doesn't just demand satisfaction. It exacts satisfaction God is infinite in all of his attributes a lot of times we catch ourselves thinking that God's love is bigger uh, than any or all of his other attributes God is infinite in love he's infinite in holiness he's infinite in righteousness and grace and mercy and wisdom in omnipotence omniscience omnipresence but he's also infinite in justice the hell and cross are built on that same foundation, God's justice. If you think about it, the cross and hell, both of them have served the same purpose. Uh, this, you, our sentence was and is death. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. You know, why does it... Has you ever heard anybody ask you, maybe you were witnessing to somebody or talking to somebody about Christ, and they say, why does God have to be so strict when it comes to sin? You know, it's just sin. Uh, but first, God, God can't exist or cohabitate with sin. Habakkuk 1.13 tells us, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst look on iniquity. Second sin is rebellion against God. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden. And, and sin puts us at war with God. Colossians 1, 19 and 20, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having, been made, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Or James 4, 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And fourth, we, our sentence, when, we're, when we sin, we become guilty of the cross. Hebrews 10, 26-30, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a, 
a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye that he be thought worthy who hath trodden, trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him that he hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Now, I believe personally, if you and, and I think that, that the Bible supports this, that if we persistently and consistently and rebelliously engage in sin, you do despite to the Spirit of grace and you trample Christ underfoot. And, and you count Christ's uh, blood as unholy, and God considers us an adversary. So vengeance will be exacted. Now, we should never forget our sentence for sin. As Christians, we just can't afford to forget our sin. As Christians, we can't afford to forget the sentence for sin. Eternity. Eternity is the stakes in this, in this war that we find ourselves in. And if we forget our sins and forget the sentence for sin, we may find ourselves on trial. And, and that brings us to the next point, that we should never forget our Savior. Uh, that seems impossible, doesn't it? But a lot of people, they do. They get caught up in the walls of the world, and, and we forget Jesus. The cross of Calvary stands taller than the Trade Center in regard to the seriousness of sin. To anybody who thinks that sin should not and could not be such a, a, such a serious deal, we pit our pitiful mind against God's infinite mind. The moment sin entered into his creation, God already had a plan to remedy sin. Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. See, God had a plan to deal with sin before, before there ever was sin. 1 Peter 1.18-20, For as much as ye know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So God had a plan to deal with sin already, the cross. Jesus did what we couldn't do, and Jesus paid a debt that we couldn't pay. Jesus lived a life that we couldn't live, and Jesus gave up a heaven that we couldn't reach, and he shut up a hell that we couldn't avoid without him. We couldn't. We must never forget our Savior. And, and we should also remember that substitutionary death that Jesus suffered for us. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ has also once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put it to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Hebrews 2 9 tells us, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now, that death that was due you, that was due me, it fell on him. We can never forget Jesus. And, and we've got to remember that substitutionary life that he lived that was acceptable to God. His life was substitutionary, Romans 5.10. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Remember, he lived a perfect life. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Philippians 3.8 and 9 Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the, but for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is the law but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Because of the death he died, our punishment is paid in full. Because of the life that he lived, 
our lives are seen by God as sinless. When the Bible says you're justified, it means you're completely innocent. Justified in the Greek is, is dikeo. It means to render, to show, or regard as just, innocent, free, to be righteous. To be justified, all that means is to be just as if I never sinned. So we should never forget our Savior. And the last thing that we need to remember is, is not to forget our salvation. Uh, salvation appears 43 times in the New Testament. And it comes from the word soteria. It's, 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 it's the root uh, in the word solder, which is Savior. To rescue, to bring to safety, to deliver. If we're saved, we've been rescued. To be saved means to be forgiven, and to be forgiven means to be saved. Forgiveness in the, mount, in the mind of God, when Christ suffered on Calvary's cross, God saw that sacrifice and said, that's enough. His, his justice was satisfied. Isaiah 53, they call that the suffering servant passage. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Uh, Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 and 53, 11. We shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall it my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. This points clearly to the fact that forgiveness takes place in the mind of God. Three things affect the mind of God in, in regard to our salvation. The life of Christ, which was perfect. Hebrews 4.15 For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Every time God speaks of Christ from heaven, he says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Then there's the, uh, the second thing that affects the mind of God in regard to our salvation is the cross. Uh, propitiation. And, and propitiation just means to, be, to make favorably inclined or to appeal or uh, uh, to appease or to conciliate. God accomplished that at Calvary. Romans 3, 24 and 25, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Propitiation was accomplished by blood. And, and the first of these three points was accomplished by God, and the last one is all ours. We can change God's mind by changing our mind and hence our life. Now, our salvation cost God everything. If salvation could have been purchased with gold, God could have filled the universe with gold bars. No problem. If salvation could have been purchased with silver, God could have made a million more universes and filled them all with silver. But salvation could not be purchased with anything other than the blood of Christ himself. 1 Peter 1, 18, 19, For as much as you know you were not received with, redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, our salvation, that soteria we talked about, was purchased with the precious blood of the Savior. So we can't ever forget our salvation. We should never forget that. Now there are certain days and events and things that we, we probably should never forget. Uh, and, and I know that we all have individual days that stand out in our memory. But if we forget the day that Jesus went to the cross, or that sin that marred man beyond understanding, or that justice that demanded sin's payment, or the love that brought salvation down to man, we've forgotten the most important things in the history of this world, the cross, the cross of Christ. And, and if we forget that, we've forgotten too much. Never forget. Now, if we want the word of Christ to dwell in us, then we need to dwell on His word. So, I like to I like to encourage the church members to 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 dwell on the word of God. The Scripture is informing us to meditate on the voice of God, so that we can be led by that voice. 
So, anytime you have a chance, take time to read and study the Word as well as to listen to the voice of God. Reading should be something that we do every day, but there's a difference between reading the Bible and studying it. We don't, we shouldn't just read the stories. You know, once we're familiar with them, we need to dedicate ourselves to, to that needful study so that we can learn how to apply the scriptures in our life and look for scriptures that speak out, out to you and start with those. Then as the Spirit leads, find every relevant scripture that can expand your knowledge of the scripture. Uh, you know, if there's a word or a concept that's in, qu in question, uh, it's really easy to find uh, concordances. Uh, uh, find find a, a reliable one. And, and remember, a tree becomes tall and fruitful by digging its roots deep into the soil. So dig deep into the Word that you'll be transformed by it. Then when you've been influenced by the Word, then you can turn around and encourage others also through the Word. And look for somebody today who needs encouragement and pray for words. And if the word, Lord supplies you with words, then share them, you know, in that joy of fellowship. Jesus told us that there would come a time when he would come and receive us to to himself and he said it would be at an hour you think not now right now there's so much bad news and and so much pointing to a time of, of just horror and devastation and impending gloom and doom and it it can cause a person to begin to question you know like john did are you really coming jesus there there you hear wars and rumors of wars and 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 you know we're having to pay a, a obscene amounts for for gas at the pump and 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 you know kids killing kids and 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 all kind of uh crazy scary things and economies are on the brink of collapse and what if this and what if that and and you know we begin to question and doubt lord are you going to leave us here uh, but there's great news. Jesus said, I'm coming for you at an hour you think not. Now think of that phrase. I'm coming at an hour you think not. Now I don't, I don't believe that that means like at a time you're focused on the car in front of you in the, or you're in the middle of mowing the yard or, or you're not thinking about it. But, but rather at a time when we're seriously think, tempted to think not. Uh, you might somebody who's, who's been greatly convinced and and even been preparing his way, warning and sharing and working in the fields, proclaiming Jesus is coming, you know, and and begin the final countdown, and you've read and studied and proclaimed your conviction that these are the last days. But deep down, to a lot of people, their carnal mind, you know, of Christians, now I'm not talking about lost people here, I'm talking about Christians, you know, deep down there's this, carnal man inside that screams are they really are the are these really the last days and and we wrestle and we pray and we cry out jesus come quickly but at an hour john thought not jesus sent word and encouraged john and i believe that god is wanting to encourage us that if we enter a time when we begin to think not then to look up he is coming Elijah char challenged the people of Israel by asking, How long will you falter between the opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. In Second King, uh, 1 Kings 18.21, I'm, I'm not 100% on that one. But Jesus called those who were following to him, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11.28 and and you know when Jesus when Jesus said come a lot of people don't understand that it means come all the way to Jesus I see so many people that come to Jesus but they don't come all the way they want to hold back a little bit they're not quite sure and it just gives them so much trouble in life it really does you see them struggling and they don't realize that they just haven't come all the way they haven't surrendered to Jesus all the way yet uh, Lord, thank you for the hope that we have. Help us to keep our hearts set on pilgrimage, for there's many things in, in life that pull at, pull at us. And, 
and would like us to forget that fact. I know life isn't about this world and that this world isn't our home. Uh, yet please help us to keep this truth in our hearts always so that we can have a free heart in you. Help us also to reflect on your truths always. Grow us in your good doctrine and reveal it to us daily. In Christ's beautiful name, amen.